Good evening and congratulations. It's a warm, a nice day outside and you decided to gather in a theater and you stayed. And now that's worse, the situation is worsening. I will deal with journalists and if statistics are true, a majority among you doesn't like or even hates journalists. So if you succeed to stay until the end of that speech, you will deserve to be awarded a prize for your courage, unless you consult a doctor because you are masochist. Concerning courage, there's one important question, I think. Do we need, do we need dictators to have and to get courage? At the end of the 19th century, a writer in a Central Asian country, Kazakhstan, said, no one can help you understand the value of freedom better than dictators. In our democracies, don't we forget this value because we simply don't need it? Are we able to take risks for freedom of information? Risks with our careers, for example? If we fortunately do not have to fight censorship, are we able to resist self-censorship? That's a very crucial question. But let's begin with di dictatorships. A few, months, a few months ago, I went to Burma. You know, this country in South, Southern Asia was during decades under the control of a totally absurd and very violent military junta. For 25 years, Reporters Without Borders had been on a blacklist. We couldn't work directly in Burma, but we were obliged to work from far away. After a long winter, there's now a new political season in Burma, spring. There, I met Wintin. Wintin is a very old guy now, he's more than 85. He's like a Burmese Nelson Mandela. He spent 19 years in jail. When I met him in a small house in the suburbs of Rangoon, I asked him, was it worth spending 19 years of your lifetime in jail? And he said, yes, of course. Why? Because freedom of information is a freedom that allows to check the existence of all other freedoms. That was his answer. In the world, there are a lot of anonymous heroes like Quintin. None of them is a Hollywood-style hero. They do not have superpowers. They cannot fly or slay dragons. In Iran, there are men or women or so sometimes young couples who have only one common house prison. 20 journalists are in jail in Iran. In Syria, Mazen Darwish, who calmly ran the, center, um, the Syrian media center when he was free, was then tortured. We hear sometimes in Europe about the European or foreign journalists who are held as stages in Syria. But do we know that there are much more Syrian journalists in prison, in different jails in Syria? In China, I would like to praise Rujia, an, an internet activist, but also Liu Xiaobo, the only Nobel Peace Prize currently in prison. In China, 29 journalists and 70 bloggers are forced to live behind barrels. Do you know that in Vietnam, where a lot of European people go for their holidays, in Vietnam there are 35, 35 bloggers in jail. Why? Because they try to investigate about environmental question, about the corruption, and they only criticized the Communist Party. Did you hear about Eritrea, that small country in Eastern Africa, the worst country in uh, the index, the annual index published by Reporters Without Borders? It's ranking 179 countries among 179 countries. Their press has been totally abolished in 2001. Many journalists died in camps 
38 are now in jail. There's only one independent media toward Eritrea. It's a Reporters Without Borders project. It's Radio Arena broadcasting through satellite from Paris. It couldn't exist without the courage of Eritrean journalists. In the whole world, if we, had, if we had all those figures, those numbers, 184 journalists are in jail, mostly in dictatorships, but also sometimes in fake democracies, because they were considered as dangerous for their governments. You should also, also know that we have to add 157 bloggers, net citizens, non-professional journalists. I would like also to celebrate the journalists who died in the course of their jobs. 2012 has been the deadliest year for journalists in the whole world. Isn't it an evidence that among them, a lot had courage. They had courage to fight censorship, to fight threats. They died, 88 of them died, mostly in Syria, in Pakistan, and Somalia. We heard, we heard, sorry, we heard a lot about the Shabab militia when they attacked a mall in Kenya. But do we hear about the daily exactions in their own country in Somalia? And of course, sometimes there are also risks, even for lives in democracies. For example, in Mexico, 10, uh, 80 journalists have been kills, killed in the course of their jobs for 10 years because they investigated um, the um, drug trafficking. At the beginning of the 21st century, half of the population on Earth do not get free information about what happens in their country or on the global stage. When Reporters Without Borders give recommendations to government, to states, we do not defend the privilege for journalists, but the freedom for everybody. I will not introduce you I wouldn't have time. You, our advocacy programs or our workshops and tools for physical safety, but also now for digital safety. Digital, digital safety is very important for the people who have courage because if they are not able to encrypt data and communication, they will be um, they, they will be eavesdropping against them, and sometimes they will be in prison and interviewed about the information, and it's also a question of the security of the sources. Without all those people who take risks, there's no way to develop their societies and to develop the capabilities of citizens. But I would like to come back to my first question. Do we need dictators to have courage? A few months ago, I, I was in Washington, D.C., having a breakfast with Seymour Hersh. Seymour Hersh is a very well-known journalist, investigative reporter since the Vietnam War in the United States. He published many, many revelations. When I was having breakfast with him, he wrote the American newspapers and he wrote articles about the drone killings because auditions were organized in the American Congress that day. And he was very furious, Seymour Hersh, because he said those articles are too short. No headlines. He told me, I quote, they have no balls. He considered that the journalists didn't have enough courage to tell terrible things about their own country. And for sure, it's difficult. It needs one's courage to escape national bias. How to avoid conscious and not conscious conflicts of interest. Even if democracies cannot be compared with dictatorships, of course, you may consider that there are a lot of pressures in those countries that prevent journalists from doing their job in a pure manner. You know, probably, the owners of media are not always campaigning for truth. I guess that in Italy you, were, you are aware of that. We also should regret the influence of the public, public relations sector. Two theoreticians conceived how to develop propaganda in democracies, Walter Lippmann and Edward Bernays. Before I took office at Reporters Without Borders, I was the head, I used to be the head of a journalism school in Paris. I decided to create a workshop entitled How to Resist Public Relations, How to Resist Spin Doctors and Their Storytelling. As compared with the public relations army, 
journalists are really a small and a weak group. So they have to be obsessed with the following questions, which are questions of daily courage. How to resist invitations, which are like gifts? How to resist comfort, material and intellectual comfort? How to resist the pleasure to travel in planes with politicians? I experienced, as an investigative journalist, such a life. It's not very easy to give up such a life, but if you are not ready to do that, you will never publish revelations. You will never really do your job. How to keep this distance? How to resist mimesis? When you try to be original, even as a journalist, a lot of people, you can be sure, will criticize you. I have to say, I can personally testify, that the best things I did as a journalist, the best books, the best articles I wrote, I wrote them against the opinion of my colleagues and very often of my family and my friends. You know that book by George Orwell, 1984, Big Brother imposing its thought policy, its new speak, like China, China today. But there's another world which cannot be compared with the first one in the same, um, sorry, but there's another world which cannot be compared with the first one in which press freedom is also damaged. A world described by, by another English writer, Aldous Huxley. In Brave New World Revisited, Huxley describes a world where there is no despotic, no tyrannic leader. But I quote him. It has become clear that control through the punishment, through the punishment of undesirable behavior is less effective in the long run than control through the reinforcement of desirable behavior by rewards. Aren't we in such a world dominated by entertainment, sometimes infotainment, where public interest information can be softly controlled? That's why Reporters Without Borders advocates, advocates also in democratic countries, especially raising awareness on conflicts of interest and promoting the protection of sources. Sometimes democratic governments do not target journalists, they target sources, and now whistleblowers, and the effect is exactly the same. There are pressures and laws to resist in democracies, but the main risk is inside ourselves. The main risk is to be frightened by the fear. It's time to conclude. I would like to tell you a few words about a picture that fascinates me. You cannot see the picture here on the screen, but you will probably imagine it. I imagine it. The picture of Tankman, also known as the unknown rebel. Tankman, you probably remember, is this guy who stood in front of the tanks just after the massacre on Tiananmen Square and the, on, in the world Beijing on June 5th in 1989. He decided to confront the tanks to protest against the massacre. They could have crushed him. A lot of Chinese people have also done the same in a less spectacular way, and they have been shot and they perished. They had, all had a dramatic courage. But we had to notice at this time, when the rain fell, crowds of students left the streets. They, see, they seem to fear rain more than bullets. Even if with rain, you do not risk more than a chill. I think that now, in democratic countries, we have to be ready to confront the rain. Risks for us are often not bigger than water drops, but we have to find the energy to mobilize. We need a very old virtue. We need courage.